Hey everybody, this is Praxis. Now we all know the true definition of being a prepper is someone who stores a lot of food and bullets in their basement. So I guess some people talk about there being some skills associated with all this. I don't know about any of that. And we're not going to talk about the bullets either. What we're going to talk about in this video is food. For example, if you were going to store a bunch of nuts in your basement, <laughs> um, like the kind you eat, which doesn't really make it seem all that much more clean. Okay, if you were going to choose between peanuts or cashews for storing in your basement, did you know that one of these is a pretty good option and the other one is going to just sell you right up the river because it doesn't last a minute past its expiration date? Which one's which? We're going to talk about that and a lot of other foods as well as how to do some basic food storage and containers and things like that in this video. And isn't that just the best hook ever? It's like, you know, one of these is going to sell you out and I'm going to tell you who's Judas. Hey everybody, this is Praxis and welcome to my makeshift pantry area down in the basement at Regular House. Well, actually, I suppose I'm more in the library over here. The pantry's over here. But even though this is not an ideal situation for prepping and preparedness and all that kind of stuff, I'm trying to keep things up and keep things going and keep the pantry stocked. And what I'm doing today is I'm restocking some of these, these tubs that I, I have. Uh, once I uh, empty them, I can kind of leave them out and, you know, to remind me to reorder stuff. And this one had organic whole wheat flour in it and has a date of 417 on it. So this is something back from April of 2017. I had whole wheat flour in here and I just reordered some. So I'm going to be putting it in today. I use these large tubs. These are uh, FDA approved for dog food and things like that. And you might think that's kind of weird using these for human food. I would also suggest it might be really weird just trusting the FDA to approve anything and know that it's completely safe. But they seem reasonably safe. I would, you know, I wouldn't put soup in these and, well, I, that's a whole, I mean, you, you couldn't pressure can them or anything like that. But I wouldn't put anything liquid in these and be like, oh, you know, I'm sure that's going to be safe. But for dry things, I, you know, my sense is that there's not a lot of chemical transfer between the walls of this plastic and the, you know, the dry stuff that I'm putting in. So I feel reasonably safe about it. They're very inexpensive. I think each one of these is like $20. I oftentimes get them on sale. And what's great about this size is that they will hold about 50 pounds of stuff, about, you know, of food stuff. Um, and like I just filled one, this one up here has uh, organic rolled oats in it and I had a 50 pound bag and it filled it right up to the top. I've got two 25 pound bags. Uh, this is whole wheat flour and that's going to go in here and both of these are going to bring it just about up to the top and that's kind of nice and convenient because oftentimes when you're buying stuff in these big bags it comes in 25 or 50 pound bags. So the first thing I'm going to do is take off the lid and I'm going to reach inside and no, oh, I don't have any in here. Okay, I want to take a break from filling up that tub and all the specifics related to that to talk generally about pantry kind of stuff. And, uh, you know, tell you which one of these is Judas and what are some other uh, foods that store well, what are some foods that I found don't store really well. I have about 15 years experience doing this kind of stuff and I love learning from experience, seeing what works for me, what doesn't work for me. And I think that storing a lot of stuff in your pantry is a great idea. I know a lot of people have the idea that in, you know, a crisis they can go hunting, they can, you know, start a garden and all that. Hunting's great for protein if you can find any animals. I guarantee you a lot of other people have that plan and, you know, the animals may very well not be nearly as plentiful as they are today if everybody else is out there hunting. Gardening is a great idea. You know, you get a lot of nutrition and vitamins from the garden. Uh, you know, not as much calories though. I mean, potatoes can give people a lot of calories, but a lot of garden vegetables, not super calorie rich, not super energy rich. So I think that having grains and things that you can store in your pantry is a great idea. Growing grains outside is, you know, certainly obviously possible people have done it for millennia uh, but it takes a lot of space and you know it's not something a lot of people have a lot of practice in because you know most people's garden is mostly you know vegetables and things like that. So uh, I, I do store a lot of grains in uh, my pantry and the ones that I've had a lot of success with have been things like uh, wheat berries store really well, oats store really well and when I say wheat berries and oats I mean both rolled oats and non-rolled oats both uh, you know, non-ground uh, up wheat berries and also wheat flour. I know that people oftentimes talk about like if you don't crush the grain, uh, it'll last longer. You know, that may be true. That's probably true. I'm, I imagine that that's true. But I have used flour that's been three years old that I've had in my pantry and never had a problem with it or anything like that. Uh, you know, I, I keep it cool, keep it dry, all that kind of stuff. So, uh, 
I mean, three years is a long time. I mean, that's an awfully long crisis to go through. And I would suspect that the flour would last even longer than that. And if you've ever run a mill, especially like a hand mill, it's a lot of work. So if you can, you know, be storing flour, uh, you know, for a crisis, I mean, that you'll know you'll at least have flour for the first, you know, few years of the crisis, that's a big time saver, and I think that that's worth it. Uh, other grains that I, I uh, store a lot of that have worked really well for me are rice. Uh, rice is a great one, all different kinds of rice. Uh, I've only had one problem storing rice, in, you know, in my decade and a half of experience with this, and that was once when I uh, got some weevils, and the weevils spread into all my rice because I did something pretty stupid. Uh, I don't know, if, have you ever seen the scene in Amelie where she's, like, sticking her arm down into, like, the, like beans or something like that, and she's like, oh, this feels so great. It does feel kind of cool to, like, stick your hand and, like, stir your, your, uh, your giant vat of, uh, you know, prepped beans and stuff uh, together. Uh, but, um... You know, I've been doing that with rice. Uh, I had uh, you know, been taking all different kinds of rice because I like to kind of mix it up when I uh, cook rice. So like I got brown rice, I got white rice, I've got like, you know, volcano rice, Madagascar, pink rice, all different kinds of rice. I'd mix them all up and I just thought it was neat. The colors looked all neat. It was neat to kind of feel it. Well, I got some rice that had some weevils in it and I put it in with the rest of my rice and, uh, you know, they spread through the, the whole thing. I mean, just doing it that way is kind of stupid anyway because it's sort of like the rice has a half-life. You'd never fully cycle through it because like there's always some old grains in there you're never going to get all the old grains out so that's kind of dumb for that reason anyway I you know I was a newbie at the time but anyway these weevils really bit me and they started going through not literally I mean they like were attacking my preps and um uh I did some research and found out that well, I couldn't find any information uh that suggested to me that eating weevils was toxic in any way so what I did is I just took the rice, I put it in smaller containers, put it out in my car in the middle of the hot summer sun, and baked all of it, killed the weevils, destroyed the eggs seemingly because there weren't any more weevils after that. And then what I would just do is I would take the rice and just kind of sift it to sift out any excrement that they had had. There was like some, a lot of dust at the bottom of it. I kind of sifted that out and I would just cook them. And I, you know, I, I probably ate a lot of the weevils, though I did find out that when you put rice plus weevils in water, the weevils float and the rice doesn't. So that was a good way of separating as it was at the point of use. Uh, so anyway, you know, I learned from that, but rice seems to have an extremely long uh, shelf life. Obviously canned goods, people do a lot of canned goods. Uh, you know, they, that can get if into like botulism if they are stored for a really long period of time. From my research, I believe myself, and you should do your own research on this as well, but I have never found any source that has told me that you can't destroy botulism by boiling whatever it is for five plus minutes. A good rapid boil, uh, you know, will destroy the botulism toxin. And it's not the botulism spore that's bad for you. It's the botulism toxin that the spore, you know, or organism creates as it's kind of eating through stuff. And the boiling allegedly destroys that. In fact, whenever I do my own canned goods, uh, whenever I open them up, because I'm just like, you know, you know, an abundance of caution, like I'll, I'll open up an applesauce that I've made and I will boil that for five minutes before I, you know, feed it to my boy or anything, just out of an abundance of caution to make sure that like maybe it was just about to become botulous. Is, is that a word? Uh, you know, maybe it was just about to, you know, fill up with botulism, but like the lid hadn't popped yet. You know, I like to boil it so I can know that even if there was botulism about to happen in that, I've destroyed it all. Anyway, that's what my research has told me from, you know, lots of, you know, official websites and everything. Boiling for five minutes rapidly destroys the botulism toxin. Obviously, you got to take your life into your own hands. If you're going to, you know, live by that, do your own research, check that out. But that's what I've found. Uh, so, you know, canned goods are obviously a big thing, you know, canned juices, uh, all that kind of stuff. You know, I, I do all that. Uh, but also uh, dried fruits is great because, uh, you know, Vitamins are important, and maybe the garden doesn't work out so great. It's important to get vitamin C and all that stuff into your diet. And uh, the fruits that I found that work out pretty well are things like uh, dried mango works really well. Raisins work really well. Uh, dried cranberries are something that I've had a lot of success with. Um... Uh, dried papaya. And all these things, are, I, I don't buy things that have sulfur in them. I know sulfur is oftentimes used as a preservative. I like to avoid that kind of stuff because uh, this is stuff I want to have in my regular life. I don't think it's a good idea to have a lot of sulfur in your diet. And especially if you're going to be suddenly eating a lot more of this stuff, if there was a crisis, you don't want like your, the sulfur, level, sulfur, sulfur levels in your body to go from here to like here because like, you know, suddenly you've changed your diet and it's much more sulfur. Maybe your body reacts poorly to that. You know, who knows? So I try to buy things that you know, don't have 
have that sulfur. The one time that I've had a dried fruit really turn on me is dried apricots. I'd, I'd gotten some dried apricots, quite a bit of them. They're, they're kind of a moister dried fruit than a lot of the other ones, and they started going alcoholic at some point. There was mold involved. It was a pretty nasty scene. Uh, so, uh, you know, I learned from that, you know, maybe I'll stay away from the, the apricots or, you know, maybe if you buy dried apricots, maybe dry them out a little bit more before you're going to store them. But that was an experience that I had. Also, nuts and legumes. You know, I do these guys. I'll tell you in a moment which one of these is the one that's going to stab you in the back. Uh, I also do beans. Beans are a great one. I've done pinto beans, black beans, uh, all types of uh, split peas. Lentils, those are a great way of getting amino acids into your diet. Uh, you know, if, if the hunting fails you, you can always live that way. I've been a vegetarian for, you know, a, you know I, I don't know, decade or so. You know, plenty of time. You know, it works out very well. And it's a lot easier to store, you know, vegetarian protein than it is to store, uh, you know, non-vegetarian protein. And there's a lot less salt involved in it, you know, because I'll be salting and stuff like that when you're doing jerky and all that. But, uh, yeah, I, I've never had a bean that's gone bad on me, you know, when I've done a lot of dried beans. And... Between the peanut and the cashew, one of these works great, one of them doesn't. And it's the cashew. That works really well. I've had these for several years at a time, and they've lasted really uh, effectively without going bad. The peanut, this one right now, even smells a little bit rancid. Like the oils go bad in the peanuts. I've gotten salted peanuts and unsalted peanuts. All of them have failed for me. Uh, I don't consider peanuts a particularly good prep. Cashews. A pretty good prep though. Uh, the ones that I usually buy are salted and also have a little bit of onion powder on them. Both the salt and the onion powder are both preservatives so I'm sure both of those things are, are helping the cashew to you know to last a while but yeah between the two of those hands down cashews last a lot longer than peanuts. So overall you know this is my experience with all this stuff you know and I, and I hope you've learned something from that but beyond that you really got to do your own experimentation because your setup for where you're storing things is probably different the temperature is different the humidity is different you really got to try this stuff out on your own see what works for you see what doesn't work for you and the most important thing is to prep the kind of stuff that you eat on a daily basis anyway that allows you to rotate through it so nothing really has to get that old I know a lot of people are talking about like they want to buy stuff that like will last 30 years uh, you know, why not just buy stuff that you eat normally anyway, and then you're just cycling through it instead of having to eat 30-year-old food 30 years from now because something happens, you know, deep into the future over there. So buy stuff that you like eating. Buy stuff that you like eating that lasts for a long time. Learn what that is, and you're going to be in a really good situation. Plus, you're not going to be changing up your diet suddenly in the middle of a crisis because, you, you know, your body is going to have enough stress in it as it is without also dealing with a major dietary change as soon as there's like an SHTF situation. So let's go back over to filling up the uh, tub and I'll tell you kind of what the process I use to do that is. Well, normally I would have a couple of desiccant packets. I buy large desiccant packets and I'll usually throw one in the bottom and I'll throw one in the top. And, and I don't have any right here right now. My desiccant packets are actually back at the old homestead. I haven't moved those yet. So I think I'm still going to transfer this stuff in here because it's better off in here than it is inside the bags. But next time I make a trip over there, I'm going to make sure I get some desiccant packets. I usually like to put one all the way at the bottom and keep one at, up at the top. I guess I can kind of shove one in and uh, you know get one at least part way down. So they're absorbing moisture from different levels. That, uh, that said, that also reminds me something else that's important is I always wash my hands before I do this just so that I'm not you know contaminating everything. I've never really had any problem with spoilage of dried stuff ever, but you know, it's good to be cautious. So I like to be cautious. So this scoop, by the way, I also just ordered from Amazon. It's a couple bucks and it makes it really quick and easy to fill up my containers that I bring upstairs because I don't want to come downstairs every single time that I want something. Now, before I fill it up, I like to label it. And what I do for labeling is I will just write what's in it. I'm going to write whole wheat, whole wheat flour and I'm gonna put the date and I'm just uh, gonna put 11 of 18 2018 this is when I'm recording this November of 2018 and that's really important because if you have more than one bin you always want to be drawing from the one that is the oldest so it's important to you know know which one's the oldest so now that I got this I just stick it on after I crumple it up into a mess, 
All right, I find masking tape sticks to these things pretty well. It doesn't peel off later. All right, next thing I'm gonna do is uh, take these guys and open them up. Uh, the first thing you wanna do is kinda take the bag and shake it a little. You wanna kinda get all the flour down to the bottom so it's not gonna be pouring out the top when you open it up. It's like a cheese macaroni powder, like the powdered cheese in the macaroni container. You wanna, the bags, you know what I'm talking about. You make cheese macaroni, it's a little pouch. You wanna shake all the cheese down to the bottom. Same thing for this, so it doesn't come falling out because you don't want to lose any precious delicious cheese and you don't want to lose any precious organic whole wheat flour. Now I know that there is there's a string in the top of these and I, I, there's supposed to be some technique where you pull the string and it magically just all opens. I've never figured that out so I always just cut it. It's really not that big of a deal. That'd be nice to figure out the string technique but I don't know. All right and then carefully put it in. It's going to make a lot of dust so you want to try to minimize how much of that dust you're breathing and how much is really coming out. So, I mean, the more slowly you can pour it, the better. I don't know if it makes a difference, but you know, be cognizant there's dust. I used to have this, uh, the pantry at the, uh, the old homestead, I used to have it in my same room that I have my office and my computer in. And so you can imagine how much my computer was loving the dust that came out of this stuff. It's one of the reasons I wanted to build a new homestead because that was a bad situation. There were two, two, uh, functions that did not work in concert with each other very well. Okay, trying to get all that out of there. I like to buy this stuff on sale, but it's still precious. And if we were ever depending on this stuff, I would be cursing myself if I had thrown out some extra food. All right. Then we'll do the next one. So that's about half full with the 25 pounds. The oats tend to fill up a little more. The uh, uh, the flour, it's a little denser, so it, it f fills up a little less. But like I said, these large containers tend to be pretty good with being 50 pounds of food. You know, this dried kind of stuff it fills them up pretty well. Same with beans, legumes, all that stuff. Do you want to help pour? You can help tip the, the back of it. Here we go. That's actually kind of helpful to have the person helping there. There we go. What do we make with whole wheat flour? Yeah, we make bread. I've heard that uh, flour dust is explosive. If you, you can ignite flour dust. I've never tried it myself. It sounds kind of exciting, though. Not something I want to try right now. I'm sure there's a YouTube video on it, though. All right. And again, not wanting to waste any. If you're ever in a survival situation, you would be cursing yourself if you knew that you threw out some precious flour. All right. And these paper bags that these come in, these are great for starting fires in your, in your wood stove. <laughs> and uh, you know, the whole thing will get used as fuel, both for heating the house and for running your body. Pretty easy. That's it. Thanks for watching. Please subscribe and tune in every Friday at 4.30 New York time for a new video. And if you'd like to support this channel, you can do so both through Patreon or PayPal.